Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Karin Academy. I hope you all are doing super well. Today, we're going to be talking about pneumonia and pyemas and infections of the respiratory system. Now, again, a very common and highly assessed topic, and we're going to be focusing a big part of today's presentation on how to clinically differentiate the different types of respiratory infections, and then obviously talking a bit about grading, uh, assessing severity, as well as treatment options. So with pneumonia, I think it's important to know what the definition is. So you need to know that it's an infection or an inflammation of the lung parenchyma, which by definition is obviously within the lung tissue itself. Now, pneumonia fits into the wider group of low respiratory tract infections. And in saying that, you can have pneumonia with an infection or inflammation of the bronchi as well. But that's not why we're here. We're here because there is an infection of the lung parenchyma. And whether there's something else going on or the degree of it obviously depends on the type of pneumonia. But you will have inflammation or infections of the parenchyma. Now, this can be either viral, bacterial, or fungal. Um, bacterial and viral being the most common. And it's really important to categorize them as either community acquired or hospital acquired for basically two reasons. Firstly, you want to know what the bug causing it is, but more importantly, the way you would treat them would also be very different. If someone has a hospital acquired pneumonia, it is likely that the bug causing the pneumonia might have uh, an antibiotic resistance. So you want to treat that accordingly. The two broad classes of bugs you need to know for community acquired pneumonia are your typical and atypical ones. So I'm sure you've done this in your preclinical years. Strep pneumonia and hemophilus influenzae are the two most common typical bugs for community acquired pneumonia with atypicals including mycoplasma, legionella, um, your weird and wonky ones like chlamydia, phila, cytokai, and then you have your viruses, RSV, influenza, CMV, and now COVID too. Now, when we talk about hospital versus healthcare and healthcare acquired pneumonia, it's not just pneumonia that you get while you're in hospital. Let's say even if you're discharged, technically any new onset pneumonia within 48 hours is still considered to be a hospital or healthcare acquired or associated pneumonia. And for these, we'd be considering bugs like Pseudomonas, Enterobacter, MRSA, um, because obviously those are the ones that are the dangerous ones, more likely to be from hospital. Risk factors obviously include old age, as with any infections being immunocompromised. A high risk of aspiration is also important to know because, as you know, your respiratory tract usually should be relatively aseptic. And if you aspirate food contents, that is likely going to be problematic. So do they have dysphagia, any upper esophageal motility issue? Do they smoke? Um, alcoholism and often being passed out drunk is also a big risk factor because when you are passed out drunk, you're often not in a position to manage your vomits appropriately. So there's a very high risk of aspiration with um kind of being passed out drunk. And that leads to obviously aspiration pneumonia, which are quite common. A few buzzwords that you need to know, and I don't like the term buzzwords, but you, need, you should ask whether they have had any of these factors. So closed camps, barracks, military involvement. Do they have any birds? Do they work closely with animals? Um, water coolers is a weird one. Um, and here's, here's kind of a, a, a compiled list of some associations. So Legionella or Legionnaire's disease is commonly associated with water towers. As I mentioned, alcohol, alcoholics, uh, whether that's aspiration, pneumonia, otherwise, staph and klebsiella. Contact with birds, chlamydia, psittacae, rabbits. CF patients is a big one. And uh, the, the vast majority of CF patients do tend to have at least a few episodes of Pseudomonas originosa and pneumonia at some point in time. TB, obviously, traveling to Southeast Asia, being of a Southeast origin um, background, migrating, um, or being immunocompromised as well, big risk factor. HIV um, and bilateral hyla shadowing, which means that it's a more disseminated pneumonia, uh, commonly associated with um, pneumocystis gerovici, which is almost unseen in patients who are not immunocompromised. That's a good one to know. And Q fever, commonly associated with associated with abattoirs. So when we take our history, going back to our basics, we want to break it down into a few components. So obviously, any patient coming in with a cough, you want to figure out, is this pneumonia with a low respiratory tract infection? 
Or is this an upper respiratory tract infection? Is this a tonsillitis, a pharyngitis, something like that? So firstly, they were gonna have, they're going to have a productive cough. Next, you're going to ask them the color, if they have any sputum or not. Chest pain, if there's a pleuritic component, and pleuritic pain can often be an indicator of um, complications of pneumonia, like empyemas or pleural infections. Hemoptysis is a big one. Shortness of breath can often be a good indicator of the severity. And then obviously fevers, rigors, night sweats, um, because they can also be associated with either sepsis, obviously as a consequence of the pneumonia, or they might have a malignancy, whether that's a pulmonary malignancy or otherwise, they might, it still might present with fevers and night sweats. Where did the infection come from? So have they been sick? Have they been in contact with someone sick? This is your stock standard COVID history. Um, I'm sure you've all been asked these questions at some point in time um, over the past few years. Have you been in touch with someone who's been sick? Any lung conditions? Any recent infections? All that stuff. And then we want to ask them how bad it is, because this is really going to be the cornerstone of our triage. Ask about excess tolerance. So I know we are used to asking our on a scale of 1 to 10. Ditch that for... Uh, try not to ask that for dyspnea-related uh, presentations. So always try to ask that in terms of excess tolerance. How far can you usually walk before you feel short of breath? And how far do you think you can walk now? And compare that. Rate of onset. Obviously, I think that's a more sudden onset. Quick onset is going to be more debilitating. How bad is the dyspnea? And how limited are the daily activities? The formal assessment will be done through a few scores. And we'll talk about the scores. But before that, we want to start with our examination after our history. So general inspection, obviously, they might look tired, short of breath, they might be using accessory muscles, their vitals might be displaced, might not be. Um, a few important ones to know is um, hypotension. So if you see a hypotensive patient, you need to ask yourself, could they be shocked? Could they be in shock whether um, because of another infection or could they have sepsis because of uh, a possible pneumonia that's spread elsewhere? Then we move on to our examination of the chest and our two main components of that would include percussion and auscultation. Percussion is when we percuss with our fingers and then auscultation obviously using a stethoscope. So with pneumonia, we would observe dull percussion notes over the affected area and increased vocal fremitus. Now, the two kind of components of, the, we have vocal fremitus and we have vocal resonance. One is you, what, with one of them, we ask them to say certain phrases and hold our hand there. And the fremitus refers to the vibrative component against our hand, but that's not very commonly done now. And it's not a really good test. A better one would be vocal resonance. And that's basically the same thing, but instead of using the hand, you're using a stethoscope. Um, and you kind of uh, try to hear how, um, how resonant, <laughs> obviously vocal resonance, how resonant or how vibrative that voice sounds. Uh, you And you would observe increased vocal resonance with pneumonia. Now, how do we clinically assess them? So there are three scores we commonly use, the CURB 65, CORB 65, and SMART COPS. I personally like the CORB 65 the most because it has the least competence and it's a really easy tool for triage. The U in CURB stands for uremia. Um, it's often harder to do and obviously requires a blood test. So for today, we'll be covering the CORB 65 score, which stands for confusion, their oxygen sat, respirate, and blood pressure. So we give them a score of one if they do have that. And if they don't, obviously, they get a zero. So if they're confused, if they have an oxygen saturation less than 90, respirate greater than 30, or a blood pressure that's less than 90 systolic, and if they're over 65. Now, if they don't have any of these, they are, probably have a mild pneumonia, which can be managed at home. If it's one to three, it's a hospital admission, and that's moderate. And four to five is severe, and that usually requires urgent ICU. Now, if you can't remember the score, I think just think to yourself, would you be comfortable letting this patient go home? Do you think this person is going to severely debilitate in the next few days? So even if you don't remember the specifics of the score, always try to think of how bad you think the patient is and what level of care they require. So if you think they're probably good to go home, 
and be treated at home, it's probably a mild one, right? Versus if you think they need to be in ICU, that's going to be a severe. And that severity score also guides our therapies, right? So what investigations do we do? So starting off, and I like to keep it bedside first, then blood, then imaging. For bedside tests, a sputum MCS, if they do have productive sputum, because that can often give us the definitive bug. However, it's important to know that unlike many other samples, for example, if you take a, a, an RT or venous sample and uh, run a sep sepsis panel, you should not see any bugs in your blood normally, right? However, with the upper respiratory tract, it is very common to have a wide range of flora present. Therefore, having one organism come up or having a few come up may or may not indicate the exact cause of the pneumonia uh, because you can obviously have normal bugs residing in the upper respiratory tract flora anyway. You can also do something called a urine antigen test. Um, and that's specific for two bugs. So strep and legionella do come up on the urine antigen test. I guess that's good to know for exams. In terms of blood work, we would like to do an ABG. Now, I'll talk, I, I talk about ABGs versus VBGs when we go to hematology and talk about blood tests, but I'll mention this quickly here. You will commonly be asked whether you want to do an ABG or a VBG. Both of them are slightly different. Both of them have advantages and disadvantages. The good thing about an arterial blood gas is that it tells us, obviously, what's in the arteries. And what's important in the arteries is oxygenation status, right? To be able to have a good assessment of a person's oxygenation status or O2 sat, you can obviously use a finger probe, which may be unreliable at times, but the partial pressure reading, you are only going to get on an ABG. That is really good to do. ABGs usually are harder to do because you need to access an artery. Versus a VBG, it's easier to do because it's all based on venous blood. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, well, can't, can't we just do a VBG? And obviously, it would have a lower threshold, but wouldn't that also show us, I guess, how oxygenated a person is? Potentially. However, because the venous supply is returning blood back, you often can have why differences in how these, um, by, by, with how oxygenated venous blood is versus arterial blood, which almost always is going to be in a very narrow range, should be in a narrow range, and is a much better representation of your oxygenation status. Where would you do a VBG or where is the VBG more convenient? If you're looking for acid base imbalances. So if you suspect things like um, acidosis, alkalosis, um, whether that's metabolic or respiratory, or if you suspect um, some electrolyte imbalances that you need to do quickly. So sodium, potassium, all those do come up on a VBG as well, um, as well as your anion gaps. All that can be done on a VBG, right? It can also be done on an ABG, but an ABG is much, much harder to perform. And it should only usually be done if you are looking for oxygenation status, which the ABG can do, VBG can't. Everything else, I think VBG is a good go-to. FBE, we are obviously looking for leukocytosis. UECs, we want to ensure they're not dehydrated, don't have any electrolyte imbalances. Blood cultures, obviously, if you're suspecting sepsis, we would like to take two blood cultures from two different sites before antibiotic therapy. And we can also do specific antigen serology if you suspect a weird hospital bug that we can't really find out. With imaging, we like to do a chest x-ray. And chest x-rays are really, really good because they can tell us how disseminated it is, which area is affected, which lobe is affected, and is also good for, I guess, you can do a few serial x-rays to um, monitor that progression if they are in hospital. So which lobe is affected? And this is a common question you're going to get asked on the wards as well as on exams and OSCEs. So you need to ask yourself what part, so obviously, pneumonia is going to be seen as an opacity, right? Now, the question you need to ask yourself is where is the opacity? And sometimes it can be very clear. Obviously, if it's in the top of the lung, you can tell it's an upper lobe pneumonia. But then sometimes you have infections that are kind of in between there. You can't really tell if it's middle lobe or lower lobe. So this is where that comes in. Upper lobe, you see lingular opacities. 
Upper lobe pneumonias are usually pretty easy to spot. Middle lobe, uh, and this is for the right lung specifically, you lose the right heart border. With low lobe pneumonias, you lose the costodiaphragmatic angle. So ask yourself those questions. Can you see the border? Can you see the angles? So let's start here. As you can see, you have opacities all the way from here, going all here. So I would say this is the upper lobe with a possible middle lobe involvement. So left upper lobe. Now, looking at this, we can obviously see that the opacity is here, right? However, in, based on pure gut, I would have said this is a lower lobe because, well, it looks in the lower lobe. But if you look closer, you can see that the costodiaphragmatic angle is intact, right? And it's unlikely to be a lower lobe pneumonia. Therefore, this is a right middle lobe versus here where you lose I or cannot see the costodiaphragmatic angle, this would be a lower lobe pneumonia. Now, it can be very hard to tell a lower lobe from middle lobe pneumonia based on just a, a PA chest x-ray, which is why we also get lateral chest x-rays, and that can help as well. Management. Our first step would be to obviously resuscitate the patient, doctors A, B, C, D. Um, and after that, we would move on to our curb score. So going back to our severity scaling, we would like to assess if it is mild, if it's moderate, if it's severe. We've already talked about that. If it's mild, you go with amoxicillin. So a good tool to remember is A, B, C, D, and E. That's actually an A, but I'll get to that. So if it's mild, it's just amoxicillin. If it's moderate, you go for Benpen and doxycycline. If it's severe, you go for keftriaxin and not azithromycin, azithromycin. Hope that makes sense. It's a bit of a workaround, but it kind of works. So again, if it's mild amoxy, moderate benpen and doxy, severe keftriaxone and azithromycin. If it's hospital acquired and you suspect things like MRSA, you might consider vancomycin, or if it's vancomycin resistant, you can consider tazosin or tazobactam. If it's legionella, you consider moxifloxacin, right? And that should be the management for pneumonias. In terms of complications, the important ones you need to know are empyema, uh, which refers to a pus collection within the pleural space. So this pus can often obviously be a superative compl complication of the pneumonia itself. It's not very commonly seen, um, and it can also be because of trauma or a hemothorax. The difference between empyema and just a normal pneumonia is that the boundaries of an empyema are way more defined. So you can clearly see a, a nice demarcated boundary and that, ensure, that shows that the infection or the opacity is within the pleural space. You treat this super aggressively. So you use a chest tube to drain the pus uh, as well as really strong antibiotics. If it's community acquired, again, you use keftriaxone with metronidazole or clindamycin. If it's hospital acquired, you go for vancomycin and piptaz, which is pipocycline and tazobactam. That's all we had for pneumonia. In the next video, we'll be talking about tuberculosis. Um, thank you all for coming. And as always, please look after yourself and please look after your loved ones.